Welcome back. <laughs> what a day. Okay. Now, I think I'm noticing here. Um, I'm doing some. I think I've. Um, I think I have done these scriptures already. I'm, I've got a note here that uh, in my Bible that says I'm supposed to start at Mark 10, 33. Is that correct? Have we already done these and put them on video, the ones we're doing right now? If we have, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, okay. I'm sorry, guys. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been here. If we've already done these, forgive me. Um, I want to jump ahead, though, if we have. Have we already done these? Chat room? Are we supposed to be at Mark 10, chapter 10? I apologize if I'm doing these over again. Um, we're coming up with more stuff, though, than we did the first time we went through them, probably. Um, where are we? All right. Now, in verse 12 of chapter 8, I'm going to... So, we have already done these. Okay. Are we... Ivana says, yes, we have. Are we at chapter 10, verse 30, see, what, 38? Is that right? Chapter 10, verse 38. I'm so sorry. I have mixed this all up, haven't I? Oh, goodness. All right. Well, instead of doing chapter 8, let's jump over. Chapter 8 is already on video. And although this is a great study, I mean, we do need to get through Mark as soon as possible. And if we're clear over in verse 10, uh, I mean, chapter 10, let's, let's jump over to chapter 10. Dang it. Um, and let's start at, uh, we better start at about verse, what, 36? 10, let's go to 1036, Mark. I'm so sorry. Okay. And he's, let's jump way over. And he said unto them, what would ye that I should do for you? So he's, let's look at 35 and we'll know what the context is. Mark 1035. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. That's right. I remember being right here because it just is weird to me to imagine James and John, especially John, who is so humble, coming to him and asking him to get, you know, to seat him on his right hand and his left. <laughs> it just doesn't reconcile for me about John. But that's what Mark is saying. But then we went back to Matthew for the comparison and we saw that it was the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who came to Jesus asking this question. So John didn't ask it. The mother did. Said, so, But see, Mark shows that James and John asked the question. See the variances here? We've got to trust Matthew more than we do Mark. Okay, because that's the word for word account. In Matthew, it says the mother came unto. Uh, let's let's prove that. Oh, goodness. Let me pull this up. Oh, hi, Jordan. <laughs> he says, this is Jordan. You're repeating the message helped me learn the links in the scriptures. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so it wasn't for nothing then, huh? I'm sorry. It's I have really had some struggles the past couple of weeks. And so I apologize if it is. Uh... Oh, now, Vonda says we left off at 1044. Really? Oh. Okay. Well, let's let's skip over to 1044 then and start there. I try to write in my Bible where we are, 
um, on on these scriptures, but uh, I apologize. It, you know, I just I have them. I have so many markings in my Bible that I just I would have. I need to go back. Uh, to the video I did previously and and verify that, but I did not have time to do that today. It was a, a zoo today. Okay, thank you, Shirley. She said it's Matthew twenty twenty. Let's read. Here is the account of Zebedee's uh, uh, the mother coming of James and John in verse twenty. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. So, see, Mark is saying that James and John asked. But that just didn't ring with me. It just doesn't sound like what I know of John, who is extremely humble, although he is one of the sons of thunder. Okay. All right, let's jump right over to Mark 10, 44. Thank you, Vonda. <laughs> Bless your heart. Okay, Mark 10, 44. Um, let's look at 33 because, I mean, uh, 43 and 44 because those two kind of go together. 43, but so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Jesus came to serve all, and he is our king. He's saying here, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be everyone's servant that you know. Serve everyone you know in his, in his name and for his sake. And it says, whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. If you want to please God and be great in the kingdom of heaven, be everyone's servant, everyone's servant around you. Don't exalt yourself. Humble yourself. For the humble shall be exalted, and the those who exalt themselves shall be humbled. Uh, to be humbled before God just would be terrible as you stand before him. You don't want that. In verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus was the ultimate servant. He served everyone. He served us all, even those of us that weren't born when he was here. He has served everyone all the way through the end. In verse 46, and they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Um, it, it's just kind of the same now as it was then in that the blind and the lame and uh, they sit at uh, by the highway side and they beg as people goes by, as people go by and people would give to these who were begging. In verse 47, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He, he is, he's blind, he's begging. He hears that it's Jesus passing by and he starts crying out, Jesus, <laughs> In verse 48, and many charged him that he should hold his peace. They're like, shh, 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 quit yelling at the king. But he cried the more, a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He's yelling. He wants to get Jesus' attention. And he is not listening to those around him who are attempting to shut him up. In verse 49, and Jesus stood still. He stopped. And commanded him to be called. So he's saying, bring him. And they call the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. So he's, he's managed to get Jesus' attention here. In verse 50, and he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. 
So he he may have had a garment that was uh, dirty and torn and all this, and he he lets go of it, and he rises up and makes his way to Jesus. In verse 51, And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Well, interesting, isn't it, that the man is blind and brought to Jesus, and Jesus is asking him, what do you want me to do for you? The man is obviously blind, but Jesus wants to hear what this man wants from him. Okay? Ask, and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. He wants the man to tell him what he wants from him. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. He's not saying I've made you whole. He says thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, you know, you can have faith in a, that a chair is going to hold you up and sit down in it, but that doesn't mean it's going to hold you up. You might end up on the floor. But if you have faith in Jesus, that is rock solid because he is worthy of your faith. But Jesus is saying, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Well, I don't know. I may need to verify uh, what Matthew has to say here. But Jesus does say in many other areas of the scriptures, let it be unto thee according to thy faith. Okay? For not all men have faith. Did you know that? Only the children of God born with the temple inside them at birth where God dwells within them they are given a measure of faith. But it does say not all men have faith. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. So it, when Jesus heals you, it's instant. It's right there on the spot, instantaneous. In chapter 11. Okay, are we ready to go into let me see. Do I want to go into chapter 11? What time is it? How many? Because I want to get into Revelation as well. Let's do Let's do chapter 11 real quick. I want to make some headway in Mark here since I messed up and took us through some we'd already done. Chapter 11, verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem and unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. So in the account in Matthew, there's a foal with a coat, colt. There's actually two animals. Uh, in Mark, you have, he's just talking about the colt, okay? Um, like I say, you kind of have to compare these two to figure out, you know, you have to have two or three witnesses for everything. So in verse four, I mean, in verse three, if any man say unto you, why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him and straightway he will send him hither. So this is already written that this is going to happen just the way it happened. Notice that Jesus is already foretelling the future. He is proving who he is. He's saying, go into this village. As soon as you get there, you're going to see a cult tied. Whereon never man sat. Nobody has ever sat on this cult. Loose him and bring him. Jesus knows this without ever being there. He knows the cult has never been ridden. He knows exactly where it is. He knows who the owner is. The whole nine. Okay. Jesus is foretelling the future right here. 
In verse 3, And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. So he knows that someone's going to say something to the man who's trying to get it. He also knows what the man's going to say, and he also knows the response already before it ever happens. Keep in mind, Jesus, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can foretell future events with 100% accuracy. And he does it uh, repeatedly. And verse four, and they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, what do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. It was very important that this colt had never been sat upon before. You would think it would need to be broke, wouldn't you? That since nobody's ever ridden it, that it might try to toss him off? No, because Jesus can speak to the animals just like he can speak to us. They understand him. They obey him. This cult was uh, knew that this cult knew that he was carrying the Savior. Isn't that interesting? Um, in verse seven, they brought the cult to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon them. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. So they're making a royal pathway. They're, they're laying down their clothes. They're putting palm branches. They're making like a, you know, a biblical version of the red carpet for the king. Um, in verse nine, and they that went before and they that followed cried saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father, David, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In verse 11, and Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. So he's being separated out from the crowds again. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Um, uh, one thing that's really interesting, when Jesus was out in the wilderness being tested 40 days and 40 nights, he didn't get hungry until after the 40 days and 40 nights were concluded. Now, this is an interesting lesson here because it says he was hungry. Well, anytime Jesus, uh, Jesus is perfectly sustained, okay, but he's He's hungry, according to this. In verse 13, And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. Now this is prophetic. Okay, let's talk about the prophetic implications of this fig tree it having leaves but no fruit, and what that means. Now, Israel is the fig tree. We can find this in Matthew. Let's go over to 24, 40, let's see, 24, I believe it is, <clears throat> is it here we go in verse 32 now learn a parable of the fig tree this is matthew 24 32 when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves you know that summer is nice so you've got leaves on this fig tree but no fruit okay now, the leaves in this parable of the fig tree in Matthew, the tender branch 
is the Holocaust. Putting forth leaves is the birth of the nation. So as you look at this fig tree in Mark with leaves, but no fruit, it means Israel is revived as a nation in the end times, but they don't have any fruit. The fig tree is Israel. It, they have a nation, which is the leaves, but they don't know their God. Israel is secular pretty much. They don't know their God anymore. They're not bearing any fruit, which means they're being drawn to Jesus. Okay. You are never going to find Jesus Christ through Judaism. And the Jews are proof. Okay. The whole Bible is Jesus, but they can't see it. The word says that the Jews are blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, that means that Israel's blindness is lifted once the Gentiles and the children are evacuated. Okay? And that would be about seven weeks after our midpoint. And our midpoint is next July. We're expecting Jesus Christ next September at the Feast of Trumpets. Not this year, but next year. All prophetic roads lead to 2018. Okay? Now, back over here in Mark. Whew. Where are we? Okay. So in verse 13, he sees a fig tree afar off. It has leaves. This is, remember, this the fig tree is Israel. Having leaves is a nation. Means they have their own nation. But when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. They have a nation, but they are spiritually dead. And another reference that shows they're spiritually dead is Matthew 24, verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. The carcass is spiritually dead Israel. They're physically alive, but spiritually dead right now. So there's leaves, but no fruit. All right. They're spiritually dead at the moment. He, and it says he can't, found nothing but leaves for the time of figs was not yet. Well, the time for figs is the second half of the tribulation period. The time for figs was not yet. It was not time for them to believe him until now. The second half of the tribulation period, um, the Jews will be fleeing when the temple's defiled, which would be somewhere around next July, end of July. In verse 14, and Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. Now, what he's done is he's saying, nobody's going to find me through Judaism ever again. They're not going to find Jesus through Judaism. Judaism is uh, no different than Islam, Catholicism, any of these other false religions. The law is there to govern the goats. The sheep are under grace, not under the law. Now, let me, I better prove that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me go over and get the scripture for that. I'm pretty sure that is in Romans. I'm going to my trusty Bible concordance. And I'm going to put in grace. And then I'll go to Romans because I'm pretty sure it's in Romans. You got, once you practice with your concordance, you can get to where you can find things pretty easy. Okay. Romans 6.14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. 
We are not under the law, but the Jews are under the law, which is why they stay at the evacuation. They're not under grace. Those who live by the law will be judged by the law. Living by grace, you're excused by grace. Okay. The Jews are under the, they uh, go according to the law and the law is good, but Jesus already fulfilled it and then introduced a new covenant. They are behind. They're still following the law and no flesh shall be justified by following the law except Jesus Christ. So it says this is very um, matter of fact here in Romans 6, 14 for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Okay. Very important to uh, to understand that we are not under the law. In verse fifteen, and they it says, and his disciples heard it at the end of fourteen. He the, his disciples heard him say, "No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever." And it the quote is different in Matthew as well, but I want us to move forward as, as much as possible today. Um, I've really set us back about an hour. And his disciples heard it in verse 15. And they come to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Jesus shows some anger. <laughs> That's kind of putting it mildly, I guess. Righteous anger. As he comes into the temple and he's casting out those that buy and sell faith and money. It, it said, the word says you cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both, but they have brought money and they're buying and selling in the temple, the house of the living God, as though it were a marketplace. Well, Jesus is offended <laughs> on behalf of his father. These are people who are selling and buying in the temple and turning it into a marketplace. The money changers are there also. When I was in Israel, um, they still have money changers in Israel, in the old city. And their little signs say money changers. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? How they're called the same thing even to this day. And verse 16, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. Now that is not in Matthew's account. Jesus that, you know, Mark is a religious Jew. So you, you can see religion coming through in his testimony quite a bit. You just have to discern and keep your eyes on Matthew as well. Okay. Because Matthew does not say that the, that he would not suffer any man to carry any vessel through the temple. That it, That's something Mark adds, okay? So you keep that in mind. In verse 17, and he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. See, because the, the scribes and the chief priests, evidently, they get a kickback. They're in this for the money and the position and the honor and authority that comes with being a religious leader. They're wicked. Okay. So when the scribes and the chief priests hear it, they're, they're not appreciating that Jesus is throwing out the money changers and those who buy and sell because the priests make money. It says, for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. The people were listening to Jesus. What he said to them made sense. And the religious leaders, when they taught uh, they just left everybody confused and and not really understanding uh, the word. 
because they interpret by the flesh, the religious leaders do. They're not able to teach the word by the spirit. Therefore, the people uh, stay confused. In verse 19, and when even was come, he went out of the city. So as the sun's going down, Jesus leaves the city. In verse 20, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. When Jesus cursed that fig tree, it just withered immediately. In verse 21, and Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. We're gonna-